Channel World lead today an exclusive look at Myanmar, where the ruthless killings continue and the military cracks down on pro-democracy protesters. Myanmar is a country of about 55 million people in Southeast Asia. It borders Thailand, Laos, China, India, and Bangladesh. The country gained independence in 1948, but it's lived under military rule for m much of that time. Only for the last decade did Myanmar enjoy any civilian rule, any taste of democracy, but that all ended two months ago when the military, one of the largest militaries in all of Asia, reasserted itself and took over in a violent coup. So tell us, what are we going to see? That's right, Jake. Well, according to one monitoring group that's closely following developments in Myanmar, 614 people have been killed in the last two months, including dozens of children. Nearly 3,000 people have been detained. One UN official has warned of a bloodbath or even a civil war if something isn't done to contain the situation in Myanmar. We traveled there to confront the military about its ruthless purge, and on the ground, we witnessed some extraordinary extraordinary acts of courage. By day, the junta continues its brutal crackdown, killing pro-democracy protesters who refuse to submit to military rule. At night, the raids begin as soldiers round up activists and drag away the dead, their bodies evidence of the military's shoot-to-kill tactics. Two months after overthrowing Myanmar's democratically elected government in a coup, the junta has been unapologetic in its ruthlessness and silent in the face of international outrage. Fearless local journalists and activists have risked everything to show the world what is happening, while outside access to the country has been blocked. But now the military has granted CNN the first access to visit Myanmar. From the moment we arrive, our movements are tightly controlled. Gives you a sense of the intense level of security with us. One, two, three, another three over there. Six trucks full of soldiers accompanying our every move. At township offices across Yangon, alleged okay. victims of the protest movement dutifully await us. They tell us they have been beaten and threatened and humiliated by the violators, a pejorative term the military uses for the pro-democracy protesters. In North Okalapa Township, the local administrator complains that the demonstrators were noisy and broke the law by gathering in groups of more than five. Are you seriously comparing these infractions to more than 500 people being killed? among them children. Are you saying that these are equal? Our minders are perturbed by the question, and it goes unanswered. They take us to a shopping center, one of two attacked by arsonists overnight. Like many businesses in Myanmar, they are partially owned by the military. The strong implication from our minders is that the protesters are to blame. It's a similar story at several burned out factories. This is the third factory that the military wanted to show us. They say it's clear proof that the protesters are violent, that they have been setting fire to businesses like this. But the protesters say they had nothing to do with it at all. And the factory owners who we've spoken to say they simply don't know who's responsible. Sandra's Chinese-owned garment factory was completely destroyed. She asked we not show her face. Do you have any sense of what you will do now? Waiting for the government to give me some, some helping. Yeah. Who is the government right now in Myanmar? <laughs> Sorry, is that a hard question? Yeah. I don't know. Every moment of our visit is carefully choreographed. When protesters begin posting about our movements on social media, the military cuts off Wi-Fi across the country. Still, from the window of our convoy, we catch glimpses of reality. Some people from the balcony just flashed three fingers at me. That's the Hunger Games salute, which has become emblematic of this uprising. I'm speaking very quietly because I don't want our minders to know what they just did, because honestly, 
it could be a very dangerous situation for them. We pass a small protest, rejecting Myanmar's return to more than half a century of repressive military rule. Their banner calls for a spring revolution. Our minders won't let us stop. Finally, after days of pushing, we are allowed to visit a public space, an open market. We avoid approaching anyone, mindful of the fact that we are surrounded by security forces. But within minutes, one brave man flashes the three-finger salute. I saw that you made a sign. Tell me what you mean by making that sign. Now, we don't, we, you just stand back. Okay? That is adjusted. Justice. We want to just it. You want justice? Just it, yes. Moments later, another man approaches. No scare. Not scare. Not weapon. We don't have a not weapon. No scare. But every day, by day, every day, just like that, just like that. They're banging. As word of our presence spreads, we hear an unmistakable sound. Banging pots and pans is a tradition to get rid of evil spirits. But it has become the signature sound of resistance. This young teacher says she ran to talk to us when she heard the noise. You want democracy? We want democracy. We don't want military coup. You know we're surrounded by military, like this guy. I don't, uh, I'm not afraid to, at all. If we are afraid to, we people around here will not hit the bend and the pen. Like many young people, she sees her future being ripped away. We don't want to go back to the dark age. We lost our voice and we had, we had democracy only for 10 years. Because we don't have weapons, we don't have guns, just only we have voice. We want but even words can be punished here. Not wanting the situation to escalate, we decide to leave the market as people honk their horns in support of the protest movement. The junta has grossly underestimated the determination of its people and the growing hatred for the military. In the capital, Naypyidaw, we finally have the opportunity to confront Myanmar's senior military leadership. I will tell you the reason why we have to crack down. The protests were peaceful from February 1st to the 8th. The reason for the crackdown was because they block civil servants. The security forces are giving warnings. Firstly, shouting to break the crowds and then shooting in the air. And the crowds are throwing stones and using slingshots. Are you seriously comparing stones and slingshots to assault rifles? The military is using weapons against its own people that really only belong on the battlefield. The main thing is, they are not only using stones and slingshots. We have evidence they use gasoline and Molotov cocktails. You have to add those too. For the security forces, they use crackdown weapons for riots. There will be deaths when they are cracking down the riots, but we are not shooting without discipline with the rifles we use for the front lines. So this is CCTV footage of 17-year-old Kwame La going past a police convoy. You can see the police shoot him on the spot. His autopsy later said that he suffered brain injury as a result of a cycling accident, which I think we can all see that's not a cycling accident. How do you explain this? <laughs> If that kind of thing has occurred, we will have investigations for it. We will investigate it if it's true or not. There may be some videos which look suspicious, but for our forces, we don't have any intention to shoot at innocent people. So 14-year-old Tun Tun Ong, who was killed by your forces, what do you say to his mother? You say that he was a violent protester? Or what would you say to the father of 13-year-old Tun Mat Win? also shot dead by your forces. We have heard about the deaths of the children too. There is no reason we will shoot children. This is only the terrorists that are trying to make us look bad. But the lies are paper thin. According to the UN, as of March 31st, at least 44 children had been killed. 
Back in Yangon, our miners take us to another market in a military area, keen to show they have popular support. But the ploy backfires. I understand. The man just told me we want democracy as he walked past, but he was too scared to stop and talk. Others are more bold. Please save our country. Save your country. These people are not activists. They are ordinary citizens and they live in fear of the military. You have goosebumps. You would like shivering. Not, they are not human. Yeah. They're not human. They are desperate for the outside world to know their pain. One girl approaches us shaking. I feel like you're very nervous. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. We are not sick anymore. And even in the night. Uh, there are shoulders and two shoulders and shoot the two hands. Uh, I don't want you to get in trouble. I don't want you to get arrested, okay? Yeah, thank you. Hello. All right. She knows her bravery will certainly be punished. Okay. But this is a resistance movement built on small acts of great courage. And Jake, I have to tell you that that woman was arrested just after she ran away from us, along with seven other people who were arrested. Their only crime was talking to CNN, expressing their fears, expressing their hopes for a better future. Thankfully, they were all released after a couple of days, all eight of them. But really, this is just an illustration, Jake, of how threatened the military is by this popular movement. The military does not have the support of its people. And also an illustration of how extraordinarily brave these men and women are risking their own security to make the voices of the people heard, Jake. Their, their courage is just unbelievable. And, and Clarissa, Myanmar's special envoy to the United Nations has called for tougher sanctions. Uh, what, what impact would that have? Well, there are already sanctions levied against the junta by the U.S., the U.K., and the European Union. But the reality is sanctions don't give the kind of leverage that is really needed now to have a meaningful impact. And so far, we just haven't seen that meaningful, united uh, response from the international community singing from the same song sheet, demanding uh, an end to this military rule. And that's exactly why you saw those people take those risks and come and talk to us, even though we were standing there saying, listen, we are surrounded by security, be careful. That's the desperation of a people who don't have any other options and who are desperate to have the world pay attention to what is happening in Myanmar, Jake. Well, we thank you for helping to bring attention to their plight and, and we wish that the, our world leaders were as brave as these common folks uh, risking everything just to hold up their three fingers and, and say, we want democracy. Uh, maybe our world leaders can get some courage from, from these people. Clarissa Ward, another incredible report. Thank you so much. Thank you.